am Elnora Parker Vicks, Counseling Outreach Coordinator for the Counseling Center, and I want to thank everyone uh, for coming out this evening for our fourth annual uh, panel and discussion about black mental health. Uh, this year's panel is, this, is uh, called Let's Talk Mental Health and Wellness in the Black Community. Uh, the panel that we've been doing the last four years uh, discusses the issues and it raises awareness in regards to a lot of the stigma barriers that we have in the black community. And so I, I always like to have a diverse uh, panel to be able to uh, address certain questions that, you know, that aren't answered. And maybe some of our audience members of uh, Nichols community and so far the one has more questions for our panelists to be able to answer. So uh, I'm super excited for uh, this fourth, again, annual uh, panel discussion. Um, I've been looking forward to this uh, every year, being able to discuss these things and these important issues. Uh, I'm going to have our graduate intern to introduce the panelists, and then we're going to go ahead and start uh, the questions, and then we're going to have Q&A for the audience, and then refreshments will be uh, served after the panel discussion. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kirsten Washington. I'm a graduate intern, and I will be introducing this evening's panelists. Um, to start out, we have Ms. Chantrell Bernardo Johnson, PhD, LPCS, BCTMH, NCC. We also have Ms. Shonda Broom, HHP, NHC. And then we have Mr. Gary Dupree, Jr., LPC, NCC. And we have Ms. Shade Verdon, MSW. We have Ms. Tracy Reed, PhD, LPCS. We also have uh, LaShawn Lewis, Senior Crown Mentor. We have Jawaski Deal, LPC, NCC. And we also have Mr. Greg Reed, Entrepreneur. Thank you. Okay, we have our questions here. So our first question, and this is more of a discussion, so anybody can chime in at any time. Um, what do you see as major barriers for the black community in getting adequate health and wellness care? What do you see as major barriers for the black community in getting adequate health and wellness and care? Um, I would say a couple of different major barriers would be, for one, um, access and finance. And I say that because a lot of times people may want to go to a certain provider and financially they can't, or maybe they don't necessarily have private insurance that can allow them to go to that chosen provider. Um, and I also see, like, you know, looking at the questions, that it is definitely the mistrust that it creates a barrier for people within the black community feeling that they can't trust their provider or their providers won't necessarily take their concerns seriously. Thank you. Um, one major barrier, I believe, and I can only speak from my experiences, but um, in reference to Black History Month, uh, with being it being February, the month of February, you know, I think about all of the things that were created in order to kind of prevent us as a whole um, to move forward. You know, so those things like slavery, you know, segregation, and you know, like civil rights, uh, Jim Crow, all of those things. Um, we were taught to uh, persevere and, you know, be resilient. Um, and with that, you know, we were also taught to survive, but uh, survival, you know, also equals to suppressing, you know, a lot of our feelings and our emotions and our thoughts. Um, so for me, you know, I was never taught that it was okay to not be okay, um, that I've always had to overcome adversity, um, and not, you know, speak about certain, you know, things that go on in, you know, my home. So I think, you know, moving forward, um, 
you know, as with as the black community, I just think that um, some things that we were taught from previous generations, I think, you know, um, it's instilled in us. So. Yeah. Uh, I would also say, uh, besides for the financial barrier, I would say uh, a unification barrier. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, there may be someone who wants to seek uh, health care, wellness, and they may have one person in their ear that says, yeah, go do it. And then they may go talk to another person that they trust a little more. And that person may say, no, don't go do it, or I wouldn't go do it. So there's a lot of uh, negative influence against it. So I would say that's another barrier. I'd also like to add um, another thing is not having the information available to you a lot of the times. Um, in my experience working with clients, a lot of the times they don't know the things that are available to them when it comes to mental health. Um, when I'm referring people to aftercare once they discharge from the hospital that I um, work at, you know, a lot of them, will, they'll tell me, well, you know, I don't have transportation. I can't get to this place or, you know, how am I supposed to do this? I need a babysitter or whatever. Not knowing that there are options such as home and community based counseling where somebody can actually come visit you at the home or knowing that if they have Medicaid, they can set up Medicaid transportation to um, bring them to their appointments and bring them back. So like there are options out there. It's just a lot of times sharing these options with them, not knowing that there's like a suicide hotline. If you're, you're in that dark space where you feel like you want to end it all, you know, saying, okay, I have somebody I can call. I may not have family or friends, but I have a number that I can reach out to that can kind of talk me off of that ledge. And just to um, <clears throat> pick back, piggyback up of what he said, basically the lack of education. Um, and also I feel like the lack of engagement in the uh, black community. I feel like um, if we had more people engaging in the community and providing the resources, you know the saying where they say, if we know better, we do better. So if more um, resources were available for the community, I feel like we as a community would do better, but the engagement is not there. You can't just pass pamphlets out and say, get vaccinated, get this, get that, this is this. Involvement, engagement needs to be present. Um, um, I also think another barrier we have in the black community is when it comes to health and wellness is that, um, is a religious barrier. Um, we're often told to, uh, when we have these problems mentally, um, to um, just pray about it, and um, and that's the end of it. Uh, it's never uh, let's go, let's go talk to someone. Uh, what? Let's go think about what's actually going on in your head. It's always uh, let's pray about it. Let's. Uh, and I think, um, and I think if we normalize actually talking about our feelings and talking about what's going on with us mentally, that would that barrier would be broken. Uh, I'll just um, add to some of the things that have already been said. For example, with the perceived racism, the cultural mistrust, in addition to that, the historical trauma and the collectivist trauma, all of those things are barriers to access and healthcare. In addition to that, um, dealing with how um, society has um, depicted black mental health in the media, that has also served as a barrier. Uh, in addition to that, um, how even say with um, current depictions of you know, like events that we see, those are other things that can be problematic too as far as having those conversations with mental health providers. And so sometimes it can also be Finding a, uh, finding a provider who is not only culturally competent, but someone else that is from the community and that is well qualified. So often um, potential clients may not know how to access the black mental health providers. They may think they don't exist, but they do. And so that has also been a barrier as far as how to identify you know, highly qualified providers um, for various forms of treatment. And then the last thing 
is creating the awareness about what mental health treatment consists of. That way you can integrate, you know, like various different things and it's not always from the medical model. It can be from the wellness model. And so I think that's also been um, limiting, uh, limiting when it comes to um, individuals seeking mental health treatment. Thank you. Many of our panelists kind of touched on this uh, second question. How does the mistrust of the medical industry affect the black community and why? Well, I feel like this question is, is very nuanced, right? Because obviously there are tons of ways why it makes sense that if you know people or you yourself have had experiences that make you feel like, you know, you've been jaded, you know? Like, I'm frustrated. Like, I'm going to the doctor. They make me wait an hour and a half. I get in there. Dude didn't even look at me, you know what I'm saying? Five minutes and the, and the thing is over. So it's, it's a nuanced question, but ultimately I feel like um, because of like what Mr. Deal was saying, like the so many things, systematic racism, you know, we all know how all of those things work together. It puts us at this point where, okay, there's this mistrust of the medical industry but also it becomes a legacy burden, right? Because tons of us have never had a negative experience, right? But we still have a mistrust. So if it didn't happen to me, that means I'm, 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 I'm bouncing off of what happened to my sister, what happened to my grandmother, how they treated my such and such, right? So it's, it becomes a collective mistrust so it's it we didn't steal it right as we say in the black community like it, it didn't come out of nowhere right the, it's based on these experiences that we've had and as a collective culture however there comes a point right where as a collective we have to get to this point where we say then we're going to go to professionals right then we're going to be professionals that they can trust so that it creates a new experience and we have a whole new culture of people that are like, I love my doctor, I love going to the therapist, I love talking, you know, I don't have this. And so I think it comes from somewhere, but collectively we all work together to eventually, you know, get rid of that, that phenomenon, if that makes sense, yeah. I think another uh, portion of the mistrust comes in um, with just having an overall lack of representation in different fields. Um, I don't think we're adequate, adequately um, represented um, in the mental health arena. Um, why don't most black males seek therapy is because they don't have anyone that look like them in the field of counseling. Uh, for example, I'm currently the only minority male therapist in a 60 mile radius from, I wanna say Youngsville to Morgan City. Um, so, you know, we can possibly increase the representation, not just in mental health, but in other, you know, arenas as well, law enforcement. Um, you know, just, it's just hard to believe in any systems where you don't have, you know, someone who looks like you that's providing the service. Uh, it says, how does the, oh, excuse me, I apologize, but it says, uh, how does the mistrust of the medical industry affect the black community? And uh, I think it affects it negatively. And the reason why is because the, the best way to treat any kind of illness is to prevent it. And with the mistrust in the community, there is no prevention because you won't go. When you need like uh, there are situations and cases where just a quick trip to go talk to somebody, a professional, not an armchair counselor that would just tell what they would do in the situation and not actually talk the person through the best thing for them to do. And I, I believe that if there was a little more trust, a lot of issues, a lot of traumas could be prevented.
Um, I think the mistrust in the medical industry, it affects black people, like you said, in a negative way, because it does cause people to not want to seek the help that they need. Um, and by the time they usually do go to the doctor, it's too late and there's nothing that can be done. And um, I don't know, I, I just, <laughs> it's like so many thoughts are running in my mind when I think about this because just being a nurse and being in healthcare, I've seen it, I've witnessed it, I've personally dealt with it. And when you have one experience, or if you hear someone who's had that experience, I mean, it, it stays with you. You know, it, it makes you feel that, what is the purpose of me even saying anything if this is going to be my experience, especially if we hear it oh so often that so many people do have this experience. Not only that, um, I find that the mistrust comes from the statistics that are out there as well. Um, the percentages of deaths for different diagnoses are always higher in the African American community than other ethnicities, I mean, other races, sorry. Um, so I find that just like the legacy plays a part, um, just like being having a personal experience, the statistics that are out there in the society also plays a major role. What we see, what we research, um, it shuts us down. And um, what, I'll, what I'll add to it is that um, as, you know, for example, as an African American woman or a black woman, um, a lot of the cultural mistrust has been to um, our structural aspects of our society. So if you think about from historical trauma, then also the collectivist trauma, or even having negative encounters with government agencies, or even with healthcare providers, that can also um, impede progress. You know, as I listen to the other panelists, you know, thinking about how this um, tendency to distrust mental health providers can be attributed to not only or unfair treatment, but also from, you know, like our own family members' experiences or even our own experiences, like going back to when you were in school and you had to encounter your school social worker or your school counselor, or even when you go to the, your um, primary care doctor. So those are things that can result in not wanting to disclose or even have an early termination of a relationship if you're not able to establish rapport you know, with someone, or even if you have someone who looks like you as a provider, but they are adopting the values, the beliefs of the dominant culture, that can also um, impact that amount of trust you know, that someone has. And we have to be able to think about the intersection of the various different cultural identities and how that factors into, and what else is really, you know, like being able to find that satisfaction. For example, I'm thinking about um, my, my young brother at the end uh, of the table, Greg. who, um, you know, like, when talking about like the experiences or even, you know, we have um, several, mental health providers on the panel, yet we are spread out across this, this region. And so the thing is, we can only handle so many people on our caseload. And so even when we have folks who are seeking treatment and we might say we're full and try to refer them, they may think, okay, well, I tried, that's it. And I even think about my own experiences where you know, I've been able to find some very awesome clinicians who've been able to service me, who've been able to go deeper with finding you know, what I need to work on and directing a personalized plan of care. And I think that's what else comes with the mistrust is for those of us who do receive services, not being able to talk about the positive experiences. Instead, the negative experiences overwhelm the narrative. So what we have to be able to do is, um, and I'll probably get into this later, but like we have to be able to do the research. We have to be able to um, complete, you know, like our own advocacy campaigns. And what else we have to do is have more positive representations of black mental health professionals who are culturally competent and can utilize cultural humility in the um, mental health arena. Thank you. So 
uh, the next question, again, many of our panelists kind of uh, tied into this as well. Uh, how does the stigma impact our ability to get necessary care? And um, it <laughs> Um, it really just depends on uh, really what stigma you're talking about when it comes to that question. Um, one of the stigmas that really um, that really gets me is about uh, the stigma when it comes to black men in the um, in the mental health in the in their mental health. Um, ever since ever since uh, I can remember being a boy, um, when I would fall down and hurt myself or something, I would cry, and then you would hear the thing, "Oh, stop crying, you're a boy," you know. Um, you you're gonna be all right. You're a boy. Um, even even when you get older, um, you, it is isn't, it isn't looked at as cool to talk about your feelings, or it's not looked at as normal for you to be upset about something. Um, mostly, um, men are supposed to be those ones that uh, have it all together, or that um, they're supposed to keep it together for everybody else. But really, there's no one to really look after the man themselves, the black man. So. Um, I think that really does impact uh, impact when it comes to that stigma. It impacts black men very negatively because um, because it just it just gives it just gives you this sense that um, there's no way there's there's no way to let out your feelings. There's no way to um, get this built up frustration out. So I mean, sometimes you get those people that just lash out or um, indulge in uh, drug abuse or alcohol abuse because um, there's no way for them. To effectively um, get that get that pent up anger out. Uh, just to piggyback in regards to you know the stigma being able to impact the ability to get the necessary care. I also believe it does have to do with those you know those generalizations, those um, messages that we've received you know from our family members from the media even when you think about like the influence of social media nowadays that can also um impact you know folks being able to access the necessary care but also when we think about the um inequities and being able to like let's say receive services at a sliding, sliding scale fee or pro bono for some people, that might be a sense of pride where they're not able to you know, fill out that form or being able to find that provider of choice. Because with often if you are you know, receiving you know, like the assistance or with your benefit, you wanted to go within network to avoid those high costs. And then other times it can even be about let's say the diagnostic label, if you are seeing someone who is on, you know, like an insurance panel. And so that can also um, impede treatment. And then what else we have to think about too is um, all the different, you know, like biases that can be um, conscious and unconscious. And then also um, the, I'm going to just say it like this, the harsh disparities in the treatment recommendations and or the overabundance of individuals diagnosed with, let's say, for example, conduct disorders or, you know, ADHD disorders, especially yeah. when we look at our young black boys and black men. And even when we're thinking about client counselor communication or even empathy, that's what else... Um, can lead to the stigma. And so I think it's just so much um, with it. And then, um, matter of fact, I just, I'm a stats person, so I just pulled it up. But 63% uh, of black people believe a mental health condition is a sign of weakness. And that was done in 2021. And then in 2018, 11.5% of black adults in the US has no form of health insurance. So what happens is we have these different attitudes and beliefs about seeking mental health and thinking we're going to be strong and or um, what else. When we think about we go to our elders, and that's not all the case, because what I'm going to make sure I say is I'm not being the token or the spokesperson for all black folks. But often we'll go to our beauticians, we'll go to our barbers, we'll go to our doctors, we'll go to our faith leaders and we go to the elders within the family, yet we're reluctant to go to the mental health provider. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out what's going on. 
I it's think comfortability. A, Sorry. <laughs> I think a big portion of it too has a lot to do with. Um, I think we have a very prideful identity culture. Um, you know, we take pride in being strong. We take pride in being resilient. Um, but when does you know being strong? You know, when is it? You know, when is it? becomes too much like when does it become overwhelming or you know being maxed out um you know so just being aware i think you know those two lines are, are really thin um but i think pride has a lot to do with um you know pride is a really big stigma in our community but i think it also prevents us from getting the necessary help that we need Just uh, piggybacking off what he said uh, with the pride, um, it, the average uh, black person usually thinks that if you seek any kind of uh, mental uh, health assistance, they just put it under an umbrella term that they call crazy. And if they take if they take on crazy to you in a uh, culture and a society that's so much based on status, reputation, clout, and they tack crazy onto you, that could negatively affect your ability to have uh, business partners, relationship partners, just friends in general. Everybody's not so understanding. A lot of people see that word or they, or they hear from other people that you're crazy and then they just they start to treat you different, avoid you, things like that. So I think that stigma of that word could negatively affect and make people not go seek the necessary care, because what if somebody was to find out? Um, I think the stigma of the mistrust definitely affects uh, people to from getting the necessary care, but it's also the stigma of how providers may approach their patients. And this, to me, I feel is a big problem because, you know, we're gonna just be real here, <laughs> okay? I don't know if y'all ever researched or knew, but um, there's been studies done that a majority of people who go into medical school that aren't people of color, they have this preconceived notion that black people can't feel pain, or they have this high tolerance to pain, or they do, or if they are in pain, they're lying. So when you have a provider who, before they even walk in the room to see who you are, but they know like this is a person of color, they've already made their mind up about who you are and how they will approach your care. And that's a very big problem that we see. I, don't, I mean, as far as health care, I know, and I'm sure y'all probably see it in mental health as well. I think just bouncing off of that, something even, um, you know, I see in my daily um, work at a hospital is the same way healthcare. You know, a lot of times if you see somebody that like is needs pain medication or is in pain, you know, they're, oh, they're drug seeking. A lot of times when you see people come into the hospital, you know, there's always that one person that's going to be like, oh, you know, if they need this medicine or that medicine, oh, they must be drug seeking. They don't really need it when really, you know, you don't have the full story of this person yet, you know, they're just coming in, you know, give it a chance to understand where this person is coming from, what got them to where they are before you just label them as drug seeking. Although um, there's an increased use of uh, text-based online um, platforms um, by the black community, um, one of the consequences has been with the increase of um, diagnosis such as anxiety and depression that's technology related. And so um, what else it, um, that happens is we're um, relying so much on these myths in addition to this, um, focusing too much on um, I don't want to say old wives' tales, but uh, <laughs> but um, what else? Um, when we think about stereotype threat, that is something that can impede, you know, individuals who are providing the care to, you know, like the general public. But what else we have to think about too is when we're looking at the higher rates of mass incarceration, when we're looking at, you know, like things such as housing discrimination, redlining. In addition to that, when we think about um, 
not only the institution is, um, when, um, when we think about our different institutions, but also thinking about the recent social injustices, how um, that has impacted you know, folks with wellness. So if you're getting beat on a 24 seven basis with these things out in the media or even in your everyday conversations, then how are you gonna expect the growth? And then what else, what we have to make sure is that when we involve our other providers in our care is that they're tailoring our treatment plan for us, by us, and not just using the same approaches that works for John Doe and Jane Doe and start individualizing them. So I think that has been one of the limitations as far as like the um, black community being able to receive quality services. And then last thing is making sure that we stay current with the trends, with the treatment. And being able to not stay silent, because I think that's the problem is that we repress, think that we, we're supposed to be so strong and we have to remove this mask that we're wearing and just be able to heal, be able to thrive and bring other people along with you on the journey. Just like you bring somebody to go to the doctor, bring somebody with you when you go and get your mental health care. Thank you. For the next question, do you feel that the black community has evolved in its ideals of wellness? And if so, how? I think Dr. VJ kind of started it off. <laughs> we, were, we were talking about this earlier, <laughs> a few of us. Um, you know, and I, I said, my answer is, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but, you know, right? Because we've evolved because we used to be a time where it was no talking about it, right? Don't tell nobody. Keep it to yourself. People suffering in silence. Now, people are a little bit more open, right? As someone said, like, look at us. We're on a panel discussion about black mental health. Like, clearly, there's been some progress. But there could definitely be more, and I feel like that there's so many different ways that we can all, as a collective community, you know, contribute to ways that it can be better. But, you know, definitely it's better. People are definitely more open to talking about emotions and feelings. But then at the same time, we got a lot of work to do, right? Because yeah. social media, like, this one always pops up for me, like, Catch flights, not feelings. Like, like as if it's cool, right? More cool to travel than talk about your feelings or feel sometimes, you know? So it's, it's that type of culture that's being perpetuated, right? Even through the music, through the everything. It's like, ooh, stay away from emotions. But then when we close the door, when we get off of social media, it's like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm being consumed by my emotions. So. Yeah, yes, progress, great for us, but definitely a lot more work to do, so, yeah. What I had added to the uh, conversation that we had had a little bit before the panel was, I think it's a lot to do with the generation. And um, I think millennials kind of got it started and Gen Z is keeping the ball rolling with us being more open and talking about it. Um, I know each morning when I'm taking my drive to work, you know, I'm listening to the radio a lot of the time. There's a lot of talk about mental health, about, um, you know, finding your finding your safe space, um, finding your mental wellness. You know, you even hear advertisements for it. And these are mostly um, hip hop stations and stuff. So, you know, it is I think it is trying to reach the target audience. But like Miss Tracy said, you know, we are still a long ways from the goalpost. I agree. Um, I find that we are, you know, working towards something. Just like you said, you've been hearing it on different the hip hop stations. Um, every time I look on my Instagram or I look on YouTube, I'm seeing uh, football players talking about mental health. Um, the other day, I was looking at a. Um, what I like to look at is I am athlete by what's his name Brandon Marshall and he talks about 
um, different uh, mental health issues, which um, is a great platform and it gets a lot of athletes comfortable about talking about their experience. Also, the other day I was I had listened to Kevin Gates and he said that he was going to commit suicide. And, you know, a lot of people follow him and look up to him. So people like that in the industries. It open like being open about their mental health situations is really like laying out a platform for the gener the the upcoming generation now to um, be comfortable. And I just want to piggyback off what all three of them said with it having to do with the generation, and especially with the music that's perpetuated to this generation. There is more awareness of mental health than there's ever been. Uh, in the past, if if you told somebody that you had certain thoughts, they would tell you, you know, you, it's a demon, go pray about it. But now they're actually acknowledging that there are people that have mental health issues. And a lot of the uh, hip hop artists in particular are rapping about their mental health issues. But what that's doing in some in some of the community is when they hear the artists talk about their trauma, they stop searching for a way for to heal the trauma and they start looking for someone who can relate to the trauma. So now they're not looking to go to a counselor. Now they're looking, oh, such and such wrapped about he went through this. Well, I've went through this too. Well, he's cool for going through this. Well, now I'm, I went through the same thing. So am I cool too now? So you don't necessarily want to fix the trauma because if you fix the trauma, then you take away what was giving you your cool points. Uh, uh, there's an artist, M NBA young boy, very influential artist to the younger generation, uh, over 10 million subscribers on YouTube. He actually has a song called Valuable Pain. And this song has like 207 million views on YouTube. So I believe that uh, the younger generation, they're not looking for well, some of the younger generation, because uh, like she said, there are artists like Kevin Gates who are now starting to speak out about mental health, and there are a lot of people gravitating towards that, but there are also a lot of people trying to put themselves in traumatizing situations so they can say they've been in the same situation as maybe their favorite artists. Um, I think you're just a little types of people, you know. That's a trauma, that's a trauma Right? So anyone that's thinking in their mind, I, I want to do this cool thing like an artist, even though it's a tra traumatizing thing, it's like, oh, I hold space for that person because clearly you're not in a good space. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I, I mean, I feel that. Kind of like trauma, Brian. They, yeah, they, they, yeah, they have. they doing. So it, it, it's like, even though it's, you know, on the outside, it's like, oh, why would anyone want to not heal it? It's not an intentional, most times, I can't, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say it's general to everybody, but I'm saying it's, it's that in itself is a, a trauma response. So they are having an issue that they are definitely, that, that, that trauma is keeping them stuck in a pattern of participating in a behavior that is not healthy for them. So it's, it's all wrapped up, I guess, is what I'm saying. Like, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but it's all in a cycle. They're doing it because they've experienced the trauma that they say that they're seeking to, to resonate with. So it's all in a cycle. It's all in a circle. Yeah, I agree with that. And also, uh, back when we were coming up, if we wanted, if we liked a rapper, then we had to wait till either they came out with a CD or find somebody to burn the CD or find somebody to, to dub a tape or something like that. And we had to be old enough to actually get the, get the CD player, or get the tape player or something like that. Now there are kids two, three years old already with access to this music. So they're growing up listening to it and they're not knowing that it's trauma. They're just thinking that this is something cool to do. Couple that with their, their playing video games like Grand Theft Auto at like age five. And, and like it's just this younger generation, there's a lot of trauma that's being promoted to them as cool. But it's not, what is not being told is the situations that the people went through 
it it affected them negatively. All they see is that the people went through the situations, they talking about it, now they got a lot of money. It's not showing that, okay, when I went through this, now I can't sleep at night and things of that nature. And I also go see a counselor that you that I don't tell you about. I just rap about it, but I don't rap about that part. But yeah. Because they're utilizing that music as an outlet. And so if you don't under, have that understand understanding of that, then it goes way past their head. They're looking at, you know, what's being told, the leverage, like you said, the status. Yeah. Um, I do feel like the black community has evolved when it comes to wellness. And I say that because five years ago when I started talking about meditation as a way of coping or helping you to deal with anxiety and depression, I was viewed as crazy. I've heard things me said about me. What is she talking about and different things like that? But now, here we are five years later, and I see people getting more into yoga, getting into meditation. They are comfortable with talking about going to therapy or saying that I see a therapist. You know, before that, and even growing up, if you said anything about therapy or mental health or anything, you are viewed as crazy. So we keep our mouth closed. We don't talk about the things that bother us or the traumas that we experience. And I see now, especially like with the younger generation, they are very open with expressing themselves and they're more comfortable with expressing themselves. So I see the evolution happening in a younger generation, kind of like my age group, not to say my age, but you know, like the older people, they not may not necessarily be as evolved as, you know, the long, younger generation are, are um, you know, comfortable with talking about these things, but I do see a change. And um, I can definitely um, piggyback on that, like as far as the different types of wellness activities, starting to see more things such as the mindfulness, the meditations, the DBTs, they're being incorporated in the classroom. And, you know, like our um, field work experiences for, you know, people that's in practical internship, panels such as this. In addition to that, um, we're also starting to um, see more um, use of like the expressive arts and like creativity, you know, through songs, through poetry, through even the performing arts, you know, with dance, body movement. Um, and also, um, I really love the holistic practices. And that's something, you know, we're starting to see more promotion of the positive wellness activities. And I think what, what gives us a bad rap is some of the maladaptive activities or from individuals who may not necessarily be well versed with it. And so I think what we have to work on is changing the dialogue and being able to explain what it is that we all do and how to do it and be able to tell the other people to take a few seats who <laughs> you know, are professing to be, uh, you know, like the counselors, the social workers, the, um, the nurses, the doctors, et cetera, you know, the people who are not the qualified, like licensed mental health professionals. And uh, I also feel that the, um, that the black community has evolved when it, came to, when it comes to ideas of um, mental health and wellness. Um, and I say that because um, even, I see that every day, even with my brothers um, in Crown, um, every semester we have this um, vulnerability exercise that we do with each other um, just to help us get closer with one another. And these are all black men. Um, and they participate and uh, they're, they're open to tell us about their experiences and they're open to tell us about things they've gone through, traumas they've been through. So I've definitely seen, and, and I feel that with those generation of guys, um, they're gonna pass that on to their kids and that's gonna be a continuous cycle. So I can, I can definitely see, it may not be happening as fast as we would like it to be, but it's, um, it's definitely happening, so. And um, for our last question, how can we as professionals create a safe space that promotes a culture of well-being for the black community? I'll start off. We can create a safe space by starting off by being unapologetically black. And what I mean by that, being authentic, being genuine. In addition to it, being able to balance the different selves and recognizing each client as an individual. Secondly, we have to be able to recognize that when folks are coming to you with race-based trauma, it's for real. This is not something that's fictionalized. Another thing is we have to be able to use mutuality across the racial and ethnic lines. So when we have co-conspirators from other 
racial or ethnic groups working with us, not necessarily silencing them, you know, but instead hearing what they have to offer, but also making sure that they honor and trust our intergenerational and diverse communities. Also, take a good look in the mirror and be able to do a personalized self inventory. I like that. Um, I think a way professionals can create a safe space is by letting your patients or clients know it's okay not to be okay when they first present themselves to you, but to also be open to sharing experiences. I know for me, I like to hear that, you know, if it's a therapist, I've been to therapy before, so it makes you feel more comfortable with opening up this up to your therapist because they understand, they can relate what I'm going through if they're seeing a therapist or you know, a doctor for whatever reason as well. So I think it, like you said, about being authentic, being real, letting them know I'm human just like you, I've been where you've been, and I think that would really help. Uh, one major reason why I became a therapist was because of this, the sense of universality, uh, meaning that you know no one is immune to the trials and tribulations. Um, so I think the more that we are open and I think the more that we understand that, hey, it's not, you know, it's okay to not be okay. And that at some point in time in our lives, we all are gonna experience, you know, some shape or form of, you know, traumatic experience. Um, you know, I think the more that we have those conversations openly, um, I think that, you know, generations, the current generation and generations to come will feel more ease and, you know, it'll, it'll slowly evolve. So just by, you know, having those simple open conversations, I think that, um, you know, mental health will be more accepted, you know, throughout our community. Um, I find that in order for us to promote um, a safe place, in the black community, I feel that us as professionals, we need to be more engaged in the community. We can't just say, you know, it's easier said than done to tell somebody, okay, we've been there. You know, we need to be engaged in the community. We need to go out there. If we have to just go and do something like this and not be afraid to actually just be authentic, like she stated before. Um, so I would say the key word would be engagement. I like, I like, I definitely like engagement. Um, I think as a professional, a way that I can create a safe space is to share my experience. I'm big on storytelling, right? So I, I can only share what has worked for me, right? And whoever that's gonna resonate with, that's who it resonates with. So as a professional, I have to be willing to share my experience and then hold space for those that it resonates with, right? So I say that to say also, I'm not gonna be everybody's therapist, right? Everyone's not gonna hear me. Everyone's not gonna receive it from me and that's okay. So as a professional, I have to also be able to, to tell myself that and not, I mean, which I'm speaking from my own experience, right? As a new professional, that was something that took me out, right? I, I just, I couldn't, I thought I was the worst therapist in the world if these clients are not making changes, right? So as a professional, I think for sure that, and I also think taking care of yourself. I mean, it sounds cliche, but as a professional, as a therapist, I started doing therapy when I was in college in 1999, and I went to start seeing my own therapist for the first time in July. Okay, so I've been helping people since 1999, and the first time I decided to sit down in the chair and talk and get some help was in July, right? That's a lot of years of just getting by, just thinking, oh, I got it, oh, I'm strong, that's just how it is, oh, I got it, right? So it really is about taking care of ourselves and modeling in the way that we're trying to get the community, you know, to do as well. So that, that definitely was a big thing for me um, in terms of taking care of myself and wh whatever that looks like, you know, not everybody 
<laughs> I was about to say not everybody needs to go to therapy and then I was about to correct myself, but actually that is a belief that I do have, you know? Um, but, you know, even if it's not therapy at this time in your life, whatever it is to make time and space to take care of yourself in whatever way works for you. Cause your way of taking care of yourself might not work for me, right? And mine's not, might not work for you, but whatever it is, being able to do that is a way that I feel like um, we can promote the culture of well-being. Just to kind of bounce off of that. Uh, it didn't take me that long, so um, <laughs> <laughs> luckily I, I jumped, the, I jumped ahead a little bit, and it only took me four years to get my own therapist. Um, doing great now. <laughs> um, but as far as like creating a safe space, I think I have a unique um, perspective on it working at a hospital because it is a unit where these people are there 24 hours a day and I'm there eight hours a day where not only am I having like individual sessions with them and also group sessions, but you know, I can actually sit down with people um, especially our African-American clients, and I can tell them, look, when you're in here with me talking to me, I want you to be your authentic self. You know, I don't want, like, I don't want you to, like, censor yourself around me. I want you, you know, if you want to curse, if you want to scream, if you want to yell, if you want to say what's happened to you isn't fair, you know, do that. That's how you feel. I want you to express those feelings. Like, I tell that to all my clients. And then with it being a hospital, I have the unique um, chance to actually go on to the unit and see them when they're acting a little more natural. And, you know, actually, it gives me a better insight into who they are when they may not want to show me who they are fully yet and they're a little more guarded. Um, other thing that I'll add. Um, I definitely welcome y'all sharing your experiences because I think that is something that's also, you know, very important, you know, as professional. And I think for me, coming from the lens of um, not only coming from like a narrative framework with stereo, um, I said stereotelling, storytelling, um, also with me being a counselor, educator, and supervisor is trying to create that egalitarian partnership with my students and create the collaboration because they're going to be working as um, future professional counselors. So what I try to encourage, I can't require them to seek counseling, but um, encourage them to seek professional counseling. And we have things on our campus. So being able to access those services. So one of the things that I do as a professor is I try to put the information out there about the resources we have housed at our university. In addition to that, having the um, information that if they're in a crisis i'll even be willing you know like i've walked students before who needed assistance you know like i don't go any further but like let the professionals take it over because one of the things i have to recognize is that although i am a licensed professional counselor and board approved clinical supervisor i'm not my students counselor and then also making sure you know when i'm hearing all about the self-care having the healthy boundaries that's the other thing that we have to do so making sure that we're not taking the work home with us. And so that's something that I see and we have to be able to create this safe space that should be everywhere, not just in the office setting. And so that's what I believe, you know, as professionals is if we, you know, have this safe space that's established, that is going to promote a culture of well-being not only for the black community but for all of our underserved populations and overall we'll have optimized mental health. Uh, just uh, speaking from my experience, uh, I'm not a healthcare or mental uh, wellness professional, but uh, I was a youth mentor with the uh, organization called Block Builders from uh, 2017 to 2020, right before uh, COVID. And we dealt with uh, the youth from uh, all the way from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade, as well as college students. And also uh, some of the adults that came to see what their kids were doing, they, they stayed as well. And uh, we were in one of the, uh, one of the harsher neighborhoods in our city, but uh, they had fights going outside. Uh, they had uh, a shooting going outside, but 
we were never touched. Uh, the, the people that came to our meetings uh, were never touched. We were actually defended. And uh, what we did to create that safe space, it didn't happen overnight, but uh, we were willing to actually go into that environment. And then uh, another thing it took is the people kind of knew who we were individually like from from different things so there was already a basis of kind of familiarity with us and also we we didn't dress we dressed a certain way and we talked a certain way so we had a certain look and a certain dialogue that whenever because they didn't know who we were and the first thing that we did was we just walked through the neighborhood going door to door knocking on doors and handing out flyers uh, come to our meeting and uh when they would see us and they were like who are y'all if we would have looked a certain way or talked a certain way then it would have immediately made them kind of probably like look at our offer and kind of reject it so we were willing to go into that community and uh that part of the community and uh that part of the community actually has a lot of influence especially over the younger generation in the black community because uh, a lot of the younger uh, generation in the black community they're they're looking up to people who they think are hard or people who they think are tough so when we go go to those people and they see us interacting with those people and those people like us then it makes the the younger ones think we're cool so then they start coming to the meetings and then uh we bring people that they wouldn't normally see like the mayor, the assistant district attorney, the chief of police, uh, local rappers. And, and, and when, they, when they see these people, they get an a idea that's bigger than the environment that they're in. Then they actually want to start coming back to the meetings and they're telling their parents, hey, uh, can you bring me to this meeting, please? And their parents are like, what's so important about going to this meeting? So then they want to come and sit in and see what's going on. And then we were just, another thing, we were just very open because uh, a lot of the traumas in our community, they're either humiliating or incriminating. And people don't want to talk about anything that's going to get them in trouble mm -hmm. or anything that's going to embarrass them. So another thing we had to do, people would just come into meetings and for the first time they would just sit there and look at us. And all we would do is we would share, it wasn't counseling, but we would just share our experiences and things that we thought would help mentor them and help them grow mixed with spirituality. So mixed with a, mixed with a little bit of Christianity. And eventually they'll come in there at first and they'll sit there and they'll look and then they'll come again. And by the third time of us sitting up there and humiliating ourselves, telling our humiliating stories, telling our incriminating stories, now, on the third time they come, we get them to raise their hand and they want to share too. And then uh, before it all ends, we have middle school kids and high school kids and college students and adults uh, that may be uh, maybe college kid, maybe sitting next to a dropout, maybe sitting next to uh, somebody that's on the police force. And it's all just, uh, when, they, when they leave, they'll go all their own separate ways. But while they're in there, it's like we're one unit. And that actually worked from 2017 to 2020, right before COVID, it had to shut down. And people still, when they see me in the city, they still say, uh, hey, when are y'all gonna start that back up? They're actually looking for it. So the community is looking for a safe space to express itself, but like we, uh, got into in the first question it's just so many barriers to being able to do it successfully and then it's also a time element to it as well so before we get into the q a i have a, a question myself that's not on the, the list of questions uh talking about safe spaces and then earlier dr vj talked about um what, what i consider our form of talk therapy so the people we go to in our community uh that we do confine into and so that's a big, big part of comfortability there. So you're comfortable, you trust that person, whether they're doing your hair, your nails, or whatever it is. So talking about being open and self-disclosing, can y'all self-disclose a little bit of, if you remember that far back, most of us, who was the first person that you could think about that you went and confined into? That's easy because I think about it all the time. 
and it was one of my teachers from when I was in school, and it was my home ec teacher. Um, if y'all want to tip it all, Raceland, Miss Mater, <laughs> it was her. Um, she was somebody who I know I could go to about anything, and I know it would stay with her, and I know that I could trust her. And just knowing how she treated me back then, I really think it helped to mold me into who I became and to be that person for other people as well. That's funny that you asked that question because I've never had to think about that, but this is my first time. This is <laughs> okay, so the school that I went to was a predominantly white school. I was probably like, one of four black girls in a class. We used to go to the counselor and I hated it. I didn't like going to the counselor. I felt like every time I would go to the counselor, then my mom would pick me up and be mad at me as if I said something wrong or then they're sending her pamphlets like, this is a um, program over the summer you should send your child to. And then as I'm growing up, I realize it's for kids that have like ADHD and all this kind of stuff and then I just, my mom always told me, you never liked the counselor until I, you know, it's funny that I'm in this profession now, but um, you made me rethink that. I never, as I grew up, I never had that person that I could talk to because I felt like the person we were supposed to talk to always went back to the parents or the teachers and made us look like we were just crazy, the crazy black kids in the class, um, which is why I didn't want to attend that school anymore. Um, I started to when I when I started to go to another school, which was it still was, you know, it was a mixed school. But then I didn't want to hang out with those people. I wanted to hang out with my friends that were at the public schools. But then I got made fun of because of how I talk. So I never had that person to really, you know, um, talk to until I, you know, got of age. But that's that's what I would say to that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's crazy that you asked that, um, question, um, yeah, um, I can remember, um, I, I was a kid, I was a, a, a horrible kid, uh, I was bad, <laughs> I broke often, you were active. I was very, yeah, I was very active kid, I often broke things, um, uh, I said bad words and everything, and I acted out, um, didn't know why, but I, I did a lot of bad things as a kid, and, uh, Often my my mother would um my mother would uh punish me uh I would get spankings throughout the throughout the day from either my mother or my grandmother but it wasn't until um my great great grandmother um she she um they brought me over to her house and she sat me down and it it was it was it was strange but I remember it like it's yesterday and it it really shaped uh, who I am today but um she sat me down and she she asked me um a eight year old she asked the eight year old um what was wrong um and that just i don't know that was, that was just it was just different to me it it wasn't like any other response i've ever um heard because i'm so, i was just so used to um being punished for that type of behavior but instead of um punishing me, she actually sat down with me and um actually talked to me. Um, about to help me try to navigate as to why I was acting the way I was. And, um, and yeah, that was, that was the person. <laughs> All right. I would, Let you. <laughs> oh, I would say, um, well, that was, that was, this is my first time, like actually having to think about that question. Um, so this is a really good question. Um, <laughs> I came from a very prideful family, so I didn't really, I wasn't, the place wasn't safe, as you can say, so I didn't necessarily feel comfortable with, like, talking to, like, people within my household, but, you know, I grew up, my childhood, now granted, we didn't have, like, social media, we didn't have, like, all these, you know, technology and all that good stuff, so we would write letters in class, and we would, you know, we would share you know, our different experiences and, you know, I could get my feelings out, I could vent, I can do all of these things through writing, um, which, you know, I still journal um, till, you know, today. So 
um, I would say, you know, uh, other peers, uh, my friends and teammates and stuff like that. All right, I'm gonna share this with y'all and I'm gonna try to be as discreet as possible. Um, for me, um, I had to learn how to become vulnerable. Although I come from a large family system, had a lot of people who consider themselves to be close friends, I would basically hide behind um, pretending to be an extrovert when really I'm an introvert. And so for me, I didn't learn how to talk to somebody about what I was really dealing with until 2020. For me, I kept a lot of it inside. And so like folks would tell you that I appear to be happy-go-lucky, I'm always smiling, but it really, it was um, because of the way I was conditioned. Like you don't tell other people your business, what goes on in your household and you have to be strong. And so I kept hearing those kind of messages from not only my family members, but my own peers who were professional counselors. And it wasn't until I realized that I was getting overwhelmed and my cup had run it over, that I made a decision that I needed um, several different forms of um, therapeutic services. And so that was the first time in 2020 when I actually was real with a provider. Whereas I had providers before, and it was similar experiences where, you know, someone wanted to focus on vocational or they wanted to focus on other things like with groups, but it was never like the issue that I really needed to deal with. And when I would tell them, this is what I'm experiencing, they would say, oh no, you're fine. It's just adjustment. And I'm like, no, this is not going away. This is something that is persistent. And it wasn't until I found um, the group of people that had worked with me that were really able to hear my story, hear where I was coming from, and not just put a Band-Aid on it and send me by my way. Because I'm telling y'all, I knew the right answers to say in the past, and you know, folks would be like, oh, she good. Whereas this time, I was like, no, I'm not good. I'm to the point, I got the shakes constantly. It looks like I have something else going on. But like this is overwhelming, you know, like um, anxiety, panic, um, and unresolved trauma. And I remember before I went to the providers I went to, when I tried to tell someone the traumas that I had faced, uh, the individual had said, oh, that's what everybody goes through. You were in college. I was like, what? And I remember, um, realizing um, that it was okay to have professionals to share those stories with. And that's what was something that helped me. Whereas, yes, I loved having my late grandmother who I was able to talk to as long as she lived, or, you know, like my dad, my mom, et cetera. But, that, but having that 50 minute therapeutic hour where I could lay my burdens down and it really stayed there, that was what made a difference for me. Anyone else? Oh, okay. <laughs> I totally agree. And that is so like, you know, I'm like over here like the black woman thing, right? Because thinking about your question, which is my memory of the first time I, I felt comfortable to really talk, right? Really get it out. Really be in that counseling space. Girl, this is a thing. I may have been talking about it but I wasn't being vulnerable without resistance, mm -hmm. right? I was talking about it, but I was only talking about it deep enough on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. But deep in the core, in the root, I wasn't touching none of that until 2018. It didn't matter who I was talking to. I was hanging with my girls. We was having girls night out, you know? I was dating somebody. We was having long late night conversations. <laughs> Mom, siblings, friends, everybody. But there was never a time when I felt able to be vulnerable without holding back at some point in some way. And when I got to that space, that's when I realized just how much I had been holding in. And that's when I started the work that really, really helped me to really be able to be my true authentic self with no excuses, with no explanations to anyone because I'm doing my own work for me. Yeah, that didn't, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm out here now, so I can just say I'm 41, y'all. 
I'm 41, so I would say in 2018 is when I had enough life experiences that shook me hard enough to be like, okay, wait, let me sit myself down and really see, is it me? Let me look in the mirror. And I discovered, yes, oh yes, it was me. So that didn't start to 2018. So it's, it's not easy to really open up and really be vulnerable, but it's necessary if you really want to have a life that's actually sustainable for any, you know. Uh, I would say uh, the first person I ever opened up to uh, was my mom. And that was uh, growing up, I was, I was tough for my friends. I was tough for my girlfriend. Uh, my parents, I was trying to show them I can get my own money. I don't need y'all money. But uh, the night I graduated from high school, I got in a car accident. And that's why I'm in this, uh, this wheelchair. And I was in the, I graduated on May 16th and um, I didn't make it home until like August. And uh, during the time I was in the hospital, uh, my back was broke. I had to wear uh, like a turtle shell back brace. A uh, girlfriend dumped me, friends left. And uh, cause you know, it was summertime. They were doing their own thing. I was in a hospital like 30 miles, well not 30, like 40, 50 miles away from where the city was. And the only person there was my mom. So I'm sitting there and I, I got this tough act on, but of course she can see through it. And just, I, I, it was just an overflow. And it wasn't necessarily that I felt comfortable or, or vulnerable or anything like that. It was just so much built up that I just, I let it all out. And uh, that, was, that was the first time. And uh, after that, I didn't, uh, confide in my mom anymore but that was the first that was the first time it actually happened uh, uh what I would call venting um I guess for me the first person that I was ever like comfortable speaking with was my grandmother um like I had my mom and dad there all the time, but I was just so much more comfortable. My grandmother was a person who just made me completely at ease when it came to talking about what was going on. Me growing up, like I used to mask everything by being like a class clown and kind of getting into some dumb stuff. But, you know, I could always be authentic with my grandmother and she would, you know, she would listen. She would give her opinion, her advice, but she, would ne she was never pushy. So I always felt like I could speak to her and then, you know, once I actually got therapy many, many years later um, and, you know, actually just kind of sat down and dug under the surface of what was really going on. That was the only other time I ever felt that comfortable again. So I think the, the two people were my therapist and my grandmother who have ever made me feel like fully comfortable to be my authentic self. I already spoke already, but I, I think I didn't answer the question fully. So I work with a lot of kids and I feel that me working with kids, that's the only time I feel that I could be my authentic self. And that's, I guess they just give me so much life. Um, I can, if I had to say, like if I even go to a therapist, which I do, I feel like I'm not even being my authentic self still till this day. But then when I'm with the kids and we can relate so much, I feel like I'm letting out some stuff, not telling them my business, but just because I'm seeing them overcome obstacles that I went through and giving them the tools that I probably have used or am using and we're doing it together, it makes me feel so good. So I just, I guess I can say, the kids that I service have made me feel very, you know, good and, you know. I want to thank y'all, first and foremost, for being, you know, the panelists, but also being able to be vulnerable with us today. So that question, I know, could may have triggered some emotions and some suppressed feelings, um, but y'all being vulnerable for us is going to open more doors for more people like us to come out and get help to understand that not like we're human and everyone needs counseling. Everyone can use someone to talk to. And so I thank you before we go into our Q&A. Ms. Randy, does anyone have any um, questions for the panelists? I'm Randy, y'all can come on me by the way. Just one at a time, please. Mm -hmm. 
If you have any questions, you can go right over there. Hi guys, I'm Sadie. <laughs> um, so we have a few future um, counselors here. So I know y'all have some counselors up there. So do y'all have any tips for us to help build our cultural competence in order to best serve the black community? Um, <laughs> I would always say just approach them as if they are human. Take your time and listen to what they have to say. Don't make them feel rushed. Make them feel comfortable. Give them the space to be vulnerable. I think that's most important. I would say, um, just to kind of bounce off of that, you know, don't go into the therapeutic relationship inauthentic, like trying to be, trying too hard to connect. You know, just let it happen naturally. And if you don't understand something, don't be afraid to say, I don't understand. Could you elaborate or could you explain that? Because you're not going to know everything. Nobody is. You know, we have to be open to say, you know, we're not an expert in everything about the black experience. You know, we can only read so much, but the black experience is more than just what's in a textbook. I always like to say cultural competency is about your own level of compassion, right? So, like, like Shonda said, like, when you're going into the space and you're approaching the client with a level of compassion, like, I don't have any preconceived notions, I don't have any judgments, right? I don't have any stories. A lot of times, I, I like, I used to tell people, when you're referring a client to me, only give me the, the basics. I don't need you to give me too much of your, right, therapeutic, opinion because I don't want that to cloud my yeah. work with the client before I even start with them. So and from a therapeutic, from a, from a counseling space, right, as a potential counselor, I would say definitely check in with your own compassion, get in tune with that. And then also I would say um, to get in touch with your therapist parts, right, in IFS, which is a, a counseling modality, um, they call it therapist parts because as a therapist, you're gonna have parts of yourself that wanna do your therapist work, right? Like when you come in and your client's just sitting there and they're not really saying nothing and your therapist parts are like, this is my fourth session of the day and I'm ready to go. Come on, you gotta start talking, right? <laughs> so being able to notice and know and be aware of your therapist parts that get in the way of your work with clients. It doesn't happen on purpose, but it's a real thing. So knowing that and taking that with you, and, and, and like you said, you're not gonna know everything, so hold that going in. I don't know everything, so let me open with being willing to learn, so yeah. Thank you. All right, and um, I'm gonna just uh, conclude with, um, some of the things that they've already said as far as allowing the client to be the expert. So being able to co-construct what the chief complaint is and allowing the client to tell you what it is that they desire to work on. In addition to that, um, familiarizing yourself with the multicultural and social um, justice competencies through um, ACA, reading the literature, and more, more importantly, looking within yourself and making sure whatever theoretical um, orientation and or interventions you're using are culturally centered and um, evidence-based. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Hi everyone, my name is Halen. I am a graduate student here at Nichols in the school counseling program. Um, my question is, what can you do to contribute to your own mental health? Hey Helen. Hey Dr. VG. <laughs> All right, well, um, I guess to start with, um, with being able to um, 
adhere to self-care. So like um, utilizing self-care um, activities in addition to that, uh, what we've been talking about today is um, putting yourself first by seeking, you know, like the mental health care treatment um, and being able to also acknowledge your limitations and accepting yourself as you are. So kind of feed off to what she was saying. Um, for me, I've been practicing, um, it will be a year this month, um, full-time private practice. Um, so when I first started, um, I didn't have firm boundaries. Um, I was finding myself leaving 7.30, 8.30 at night, and it was just, you know, it was getting ridiculous. Um, Self-care for me is really, really, really important. Um, you have to take care of yourself in order to take care of other people. I mean, that's, that's just what it is. Um, and then also, too, um, my graduate program, um, I graduated from Lamar in Beaumont, um, and they made us um, see a therapist while we were becoming a therapist. So over time, um, while I was in school and then when I graduated, I just kept that going. Um, so I would definitely, you know, if you're not in therapy now, try to, you know, connect with a, a therapist now while you're in school. And whenever you graduate, that transition would be a, a little bit easier for you. I would definitely say, too, um, slow down. Ask yourself. Are you moving too fast? And if you are, try to slow down, whatever that looks like, you know? If that mean, whatever it means, I mean, it can mean so many different things, right? So many different people, like, we got to find time to slow down. And the reason why is because when you slow down, it's easier to hear what you need to hear right? Your answers that are on the inside. You can't hear no whisper from the inside. If you move it too fast, if you got 50 bajillion things going on, if you got the radio going, if you, you know, trying to be all these different places and do all these, say yes to all these different things. So I would say that in terms of if you're thinking about how can you, you know, what can you do to take care of your mental health? Simple. Ask yourself, do you have too much on your plate? And if you do, find a way to just Take one thing off, you know? Don't try to drop everything, but, you know, just, yeah, slow down. That's, that's my biggest thing, and I have to tell myself that often, too. Slow down, and when I do, I can definitely hear that, oh, I've been missing some things, right? I can hear a little bit more clearly, feel a little bit more connected. I feel like I have a little bit more of an idea of my direction or what I need to do or where I need to go, but none of that's coming in unless I slow down, so. One thing I would like to add is that imposter syndrome is a thing and don't listen to it because it will have you doubting yourself once you get out into the field and having you wondering, am I really cut out to be a counselor? And you have to tell yourself that, you know, you were trained in this, you've been given all the right tools, and while you may not know everything, you're always willing to learn new things. So don't let imposter syndrome get to you. Uh, I would just say uh, self-acceptance, uh, the mindset that nothing happens to you, everything happens for you, uh, a good diet, exercise, and meditation. Thank you. Any more questions for the panelists? Uh, Brandon has a question. All right, Brandon. Uh, <laughs> I have more of a comment than a question. It's kind of just maybe kind of serving as a PSA to anybody else who's thinking about getting into like going to counseling and stuff like that. So I've been to the counselor twice, not like two sessions, but I've been to two separate counselors and I could only say I've authentically been once. 
uh, the first one I went to, it was a white guy. You know, I felt like kind of mixing together kind of what Mr. Gary said. Like, I wasn't able to really be myself with him. I just kind of kept it, you know, gave him 50% of what was really happening and, you know, did my session and left. But then, you know, it got real, real bad. So I had to go to Miss Randy, you know, kind of advocating for you to get a job if that, you know, happens. So I went to Miss Randy and then she kind of, uh, you know, Help me tear down all the stuff that I had built up thinking, because I originally wanted you. I'm gonna be honest with you. You remind me, no, I'm gonna be honest with you. I wanted you because you reminded me of, like, you know, he said, my mama. You know what I'm saying? That's the person I always talk to my mama. My schedule don't. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good though, but I'm glad, you know what I'm saying? I'm glad I met her. So, uh, you know, I originally wanted, my, wanted somebody that, you know, I could identify with that looked like me and like was kind of like a woman, because I don't feel comfortable talking about my problems to men. I no disrespect to, you know, any of y'all, but it's just true. It's just true. I really don't feel comfortable telling my problems to men. I don't know if that's because, like, my dad and my uncles and all of them. I don't know. Yeah, see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get what I'm saying? So, um... But that show diversity is important because she doesn't identify as you, but she's right. able to help you still. Right. She kind of, like, got with me on a one-on-one -on -one level and was able to kind of, like, help me through whatever I was going through. And I don't know, you know... She went to Central, I went to Hanville, so like we have that kind of connection. That's what, the kind of connection I had to make in my head to be able to, you know, authentically open up and be myself, but it helped. So if you're thinking about going, go, because you never know like who you're gonna encounter. You know, you got the future counselors of America around here and stuff like that. You know, everything like that. Just, just take the leap of faith and go, like if you're ready to go. I'm not saying go if you're like not willing to open up and like authentically let them help you, you know, get help. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Thank you so much. And just like he said, he went to two counselors. You have options. You have options out there to where, if, you know, you're not comfortable or that counselor just doesn't fit you, then you can have options to find other counselors that can fit you. Don't give up. And to add to that, um, also, whenever you're seeking a counselor and you start going, be patient with your process. Um, I was going to one counselor because I, I dealt with, I have a two-year-old, my one and only, um, and I dealt with postpartum depression, um, really, really hard place. And she kept, when I first started going to her, she just kept asking me the same questions and I was getting agitated with her. Like, why are you asking me to repeat when I graduated from undergrad? I don't remember, I'm telling you 2000. Then she's making me think about when I graduated from my master's. I don't remember, ma'am. Like it's two years after what I told you with the undergrad. So she just kept pushing me and pushing me. And so I was just like, but I had to go to her, you know, that was the, that was what my, you know, my um, OBGYN had, you know, I need you to go, I need you to go. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna keep going to her. But she kept aggravating, asking me the same. I felt like I knew exactly what she wanted, like, cause I felt like I did this before. And I don't know, I just was getting aggravated. But as time progressed and I became more patient with her, um, as far as my process, I actually ended up liking her. And it actually did work out very well. Um, I overcame that obstacle dealing with the postpartum depression. And now I feel like not saying I know everything um, about it, but I experienced something dealing with that. And, um, you know, she makes me feel confident that I could help other people. Any more questions? Hi guys. So I am currently a counselor in the Counseling Center. Um, I also supervise some of our graduate students and one day hope to be a counselor educator. And what is something as a professional in the field y'all would encourage, and as a student affairs professional, what are some things y'all would recommend, I guess for me and other student affairs professionals, to encourage more young black people to go into the mental health field and to, to go into these healthcare professions so that they can see more faces like them if that's something that they want later in life. All right, um, to begin with, job fairs, um, community events. In addition to that, um, going to the programs that the students attend so that way they see you and see that you have a genuine invested um, interest in it. Uh, for example, one of the things I do with my career counseling class is I invite um, various different counselors and or mental health professionals into the classroom so they can talk to the students about um, 
their desired um, career trajectory and have them, you know, interview folks. And so um, I've done that in the past, and um, that's something that's been beneficial. So like having like students maybe shadow people um, in the community, that way they can see what a day in a counselor, or what a day in the life of a counselor looks like. Because I tell people it's not going to be the same thing. You know, like for example, students who may have interned at the counseling center, let's say last semester, the experience is going to be different this semester, or even with like COVID with the students um, a year ago. And so um, being able to familiarize, you know, students with um, how they're going to have to be able to use, let's say, technology, but also um, the language that they're going to have to use when reaching, you know, their desired clientele. So I'm thinking, you know, starting off with this particular campus early on, like, you know, starting in the first semester courses, like going to those intro level classes and, you know, like introducing yourselves, doing those kind of uh, classroom presentations. When there's like Greek week on campus, making sure the counseling center is a part of that. And that way you can tap a population that may not necessarily, you know, know what it is you do. And then having the information, not only on the website, but like the bulletin boards, social media. You know, since um, a lot of our, we know with our Generation Z, they're using social media more. And then also with the interns, having kind of like that peer-to-peer -peer, um, network. And then what else I'm thinking with some of our panelists today, those mentors also, I'm a proponent of mentoring. So like having, um, having that also to be able to point out not only what counseling is, but also utilizing your mentors for um, other things that you may not be able to do in your role, you know, to prevent like any type of, you know, like dual relationship. Cause I know that's one of the problems we have is with the, you know, like with cross, uh, I call it like the cross boundaries on campus where so many of us have so many different roles. And that's just a few things I could think of. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. You know what? I will, I will say one thing. I, I, I definitely think as a counseling center, for sure. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you, you are right. But one thing that I, I did when I worked in student affairs was connecting with the residents' life. So, you know, going into the residence hall. So, you know, RAs got to have a little program in the lobby or whatever, like, you know, try to connect with them in that way to bring mental health, like, right down into the lobby. You know, that, that might be helpful just because, you know, students that have so much going on, sometimes it's helpful to just, oh, we're going to walk in the lobby and there's a program going on, oh, let me sit and So that was one thing that I utilized when I was in college. I'm already in events, so. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, this is it for our program today. Um, again, I wanna thank our panelists for coming out and taking the time to be able to sp um, spread awareness, uh, help to reduce the stigmas in our community. Uh, I wanna help e thank everyone for coming out and uh, listening. We have refreshments outside or uh, well, in the front area. And I also wanna thank Synergy for all of their donations that help paid for this event. So again, have a uh, good night and thank you all for coming.